Hi, it's Thursday, May the 26th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through the book of Exodus. And today it's Exodus 16, verses 13 to 16. Just just a couple of verses. Where it, it, we're going to cut short, but I just want to do it a bit at a time. Um, so that's all we have today is Exodus 16, 13 to 16. So it should be short, right? Um, to get to this moment, you'll remember the, the Israelites were in the wilderness. They were in Elim, which was a really nice place to be. I think I've mentioned before, 12 springs, uh, 70 palms. Um, but they moved on from there. And of course, as soon as they move on from a comfortable place, they start to worry and complain about food. So they're complaining to Moses about food constantly. Uh, why did you bring us out here to die? God talks to Moses and says, okay, so tell the Israelites they will have meat at night and bread from heaven in the morning. So Moses and Aaron do that. They gather the Israelites. The glory of God is shining in the clouds. Um, it, it is also very possible that they overhear God speaking to Moses. At least that's what the text, I think, suggested. But most importantly, Moses tells them what God has said. You know, why are you complaining to me? It's really, this is about you and God, not about me. Um, but God will provide you meat at night and bread in the morning. And so then here's what happens. Exodus 16. 13 to 16. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. And then we go on with more about collection and distribution, but I will share that um, tomorrow. So just, just now, we have, kale, we have quails in the evening and not kale. No, nobody wanted kale. <laughs> we have quails in the evening, uh, and we have this and we have this fine flaky substance, um, this bread from heaven in the morning. Um, when they say to one another, like, what is it? When they're talking about this, uh, what is it? Um, that's where the word manna comes from. That's literally that, that ancient Hebrew, what is it? Uh, manna means what is it? Um, so that's what we call it, the what is it? Um, anyway, <sighs> So what is there to wonder about this? God said a thing would happen, and the thing happened. Well, where's the wondering, Norm? Um, well, there are those who read this passage, and, I, and I'm, I've preached it this way. Those who read this passage and go, okay, so what's interesting here is that um, that quail um, do settle down in the evening. Um, transmigratory quail crossing the desert. Uh, they do get tired and they they land for the night. So you're not going to have much luck um, hunting quail during the day. But if you wait at night and all is quiet, they're going to land to find a place to sleep um, and to, well, they just don't have the strength to keep flying. Uh, and that's easy to catch them. So there it is. Science. Uh, and then there are those who will tell you that manna is very likely... Um, uh, uh, a protein secretion from insects. Um, they get it from saps and trees. And, it, and anyway, it's sweet and it's full of protein. Uh, and it does um, it does melt in the sun. So it's there in the morning and gone fairly quickly. Uh, and and in fact, uh, Bedou and, and uh, desert travelers have been known to eat this very thing. Um, so that's indeed uh, what it could be. And see, people say, there, there you go. There's the science. Got it. I, but as you've heard me say again and again, I'm not really interested in proving that this happened historically or that it could have happened historically. I'm more interested in what's going on in the story. Um, and with the quail, well, yeah, that makes sense, uh, the science part of it, except that they're transmigratory birds. So the quail aren't there year round. Uh, we're going to be 40 years in the desert. Um and the amount of manna we're talking about, that's, that's peculiar. Now, I know that historical stories, uh, we exaggerate. Um, but if we accept the exaggeration, maybe we can accept that maybe something else is going on here. But whatever it is, I don't know that it matters. Um, I, I have preached this story that, that, what, that, that what's really going on 
is that is the Israelites are in the wilderness and they don't know how to live in the wilderness. They know how to live in Egypt. So it takes them time to learn that food isn't just picked up at the market uh, or found the way they found it in Egypt. In fact, food, you have to, you have to know how quail um, are going to be available, when they're going to be available, and then you have to be ready to snare them. You have to learn that. You don't just know it automatically. You have to learn that that substance uh, on the ground is, is good for you and proteinous and, 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 and enjoyable, like it's sweet. Uh, and it takes time. So when you resist change, you are going to stay in the wilderness. So then this becomes a story about resisting change. Uh, if they would learn to live in the wilderness like the Badu, like, like, like the nomadic travelers, that by the way, they used to be, 400 years ago before they settled into Egypt, uh, if, they could, if they could be that way again, they would thrive and they would likely spend less time in the wilderness. That's basically how I've preached it. Uh, relying on this idea that yes, this is about, um, about about science and history and how you catch quail and how you eat um, that f filmy, sweet substance full of protein that comes out of insects. Um, that works. But the first people to hear this story, again, weren't concerned about proving that it was actually possible. Uh, they took it on faith that it happened. So then to me, what, what is the message in this? Um, at night, the quails came and covered the camp, which is pretty much what God promised. When I hear meat, I think, of course, like, you know, a steak. I don't, it's weird, I don't think of birds. Uh, that's, that's foul, that's not meat, but it is. Uh, so, so what they asked for is there. It happened. When the bread arrived, they didn't know that it was bread. Hence, still calling it to this day, what is it? What is this? I think there's an opportunity for us to wonder about our experiences of God and the way that God engages with us. Sometimes it's obvious and very, very clear. But other times it requires some imagination, some opening up of the mind. Sometimes we need help to understand what God is saying to us. It's why I like doing this kind of thing in a group where we can talk to each other and listen to each other and gain from each other's experience. It was Moses who said to them, no, no, seriously, it's okay, don't worry about this. Go ahead, eat it. It's good. Um, now, I've just eaten it like I eat with my finger um, when indeed... Um, we're told as we go on that there's a way of milling it and it, anyway um, <clears throat> sometimes to understand what god is saying or what god is doing for us we need to let go of our specific expectation uh, yesterday i was talking about sort of how we expect god to sound uh, and and we get so wrapped up in our expectation that we might be missing a broader appreciation of God. Well, I think the same thing is, is, is shown here. Uh, we wanted meat and kale showed up. There you go. Exactly what I wanted. Fantastic. So in the morning, I'm guessing bread, like in bags, will just drop from the sky, but it didn't. What's, what's this? We were expecting bread to look like bread, but sometimes we have to reimagine we have to say, okay, so God promised, I don't see any bread, so what's this stuff? How could this be bread? Could this be what God has sent me? And I, I've often thought about that with people who wander, wander into my life uh, or things that happen. Uh, I'm expecting God to act a certain way. I've asked, I've prayed, I have hoped, I have done everything I can to make a certain uh, a result um, occur, and then this wild card pops up. Another person pops into my life. Oh, what are you doing in this now? But I can prayerfully discern that they are here to help me. Uh, or, more to the point, if I assume 
and that God has sent them to help me, I am more likely to get a better result. If I let go of my specific expectation around that result, I might find that the good I had hoped to achieve can be achieved in a different way. For me, this becomes a story about letting go of expectation uh, and being open to, to a new way of achieving my goals. Um, yeah, this, this, this is a, a, a tricky story uh, for me at times. Um, I once made uh, the remark um, to the woman who would become my wife, although I don't know why she would after I said something as dumb as early in our dating days, saying something to the effect of, uh, well, the thing for me is that I, 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 always, I always get what I want. Um, what a remarkably arrogant thing to say. But I went on to try to explain it's because, because when what I want isn't happening, I then learn to want something else. I let go of that, that that specific expectation and I look to see what it is that that God is providing me. I really did say that and believe that in my early 20s and I stick to it now in my not early 20s. <laughs> um, that cough was uh, added for uh, emphasis just to imply, just to make clear that I'm no longer in my early 20s. Um, for me, this is a story about, about letting go of the expectations. So yes, I really want bread, but bread isn't here. Well, then, then you need to want another thing. So I just sort of keep wanting something until God coincidentally meets that need. No, I think that we have to look and see what it is that God is providing and learn how that is what you want or more to the point, what you need. And then recognizing that, discover that it's the thing that you want. Um, it's about aligning your want with God's will. At least that's what the story provides for me. And maybe I'm way out in left field. Maybe this doesn't hold up for you. Um, but it has held up for me for many decades. Um... And as I read this story, I also recognize that sometimes it's very hard to do on your own. You sometimes have to trust others and uh, trust them by telling them that you don't know what's going on and trust them by sometimes following their lead even when you're not sure. And that's perhaps how we get that bread from heaven, the thing that we need. Um, I don't know about you, but I am very often reluctant to go to somebody and say, like, what, what is this? This stuff on the ground. I know I should know what it is because, like, yeah, I don't know what it is. Could, could you, can you help me? There's a vulnerability in that. Uh, and it's not something that we're encouraged to do, uh, at least not in the world I live in. Um, the world I live in is uh, competitive. Um, and we always want to have an edge. And so you don't keep your edge over your competition who by the way are often you're also your colleagues you don't keep your edge over them by showing your weakness uh, or your ignorance so the idea of going to somebody and just like I, I don't understand this could, could you could you help me could you explain this to me um, I don't know what God is saying to me right now I'm not clear what it is I should be praying for I don't know uh, what's going to happen next? Could you help me? So there's that vulnerability. Um, this story, I think, invites us into that. And then it also invites us into then listening. Moses said to them, it's bread. The Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord's commanded. Gather as much of it as you need. An omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. And so they start collecting this stuff because Moses said so. Now, in fairness, we did hear God just speak to Moses. And the glory of God was there and all of that. I get it, so we're going to respect Moses. Uh, you and I don't always get to see the glory of God behind somebody. Um, but when we don't know something, 
sometimes it makes sense to follow another person's wisdom. Just follow them down that path. Don't don't keep what, why, why this? Sometimes we just need to follow for a little bit. And we need to trust their wisdom, even though it's not our wisdom. In time, their wisdom might become ours, but, but being open to that. And again, that's a challenge for me. I might be vulnerable to you. And then when you explain something to me because I didn't understand it, I might well dissect it in my head until it makes sense to me. And once it makes sense to me, then maybe I'm going to do it. Yep. And that works sometimes. Doesn't work if you're going to get somebody to explain a train schedule for you. Because by the time you've made it, had it make sense to you, the train is gone and you've missed it. Sometimes when someone says, well, no, what it is, it leaves at 4.10 and it's on track 6. That's in 5 minutes. Sometimes you just have to run to track 6. Not go and pull out a dictionary and see if they got all their words right because it might be in a foreign language. No, just go. Sometimes you just go. This, for me, is a story that invites me to think about those things. Those times that I have just gone. And those times that I've held back and, and, and played around with it until it made sense to me. Uh, and to wonder whether, how, where have I benefited? It's not an obvious always do one or always do the other. But sometimes, sometimes not only do we have to be vulnerable, but we actually have to follow wisdom that we don't completely understand. And trust that the understanding will come later. Most of the time when I've done that, there has been a payoff. At least sitting here right now, that's how it feels to me. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. I know this is a short passage, uh, and I know that I haven't given you a whole lot. I'm really sort of sticking on, on, on one thing. Um, but I invite you to wonder about this passage, because I think there's, there's, there's a lot in this. The way that God sometimes gives us exactly what we expect, exactly what we want. And it came in the exact right package, and it's wrapped perfectly, the quail. And sometimes God interacts with us and gives us, we didn't expect that. What is it? And we have to figure it out. Very often, when we don't understand what it is, we assume that God hasn't given us anything. Um, the challenge, of course, is to recognize that God is a healing God. That God does not want us to starve. That God wants us to be nurtured. And so the things around us can nurture us if, we let go of expectation. I'm turning it into a sermon, so I'll stop now. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the many ways that you provide for us. We thank you for the obvious ways. And we thank you for the ways that aren't as obvious, but but over time and with community and with trusting others, we can figure out exactly what it is that you have offered us. Quail at night, bread in the morning, all that we need to not only survive, but to thrive. Thank you for this time, God. May this be one of those times that helps us to thrive. We pray in the name of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And with that, friends, I, uh, I will bid you adieu. Have an excellent day. I hope to see you tomorrow. And until I see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you, that God loves you, that God wants you to have what you need, and that God's love moves through you. Because sometimes what others need is the very love that you can provide. You matter. God bless. See you tomorrow.